As Americans, we are taught from an early age to value the study of history as a vital part of our education and our identity as a nation. Study of the American West has been extensive. The number of books published is second only to those written about the Civil War. But within all those volumes, references to African Americans are extremely rare. Today, historians are rediscovering the contributions of African Americans, recognizing their impact as a people, and exploring race relations as they played out in the Wild West. In this five-part series, Professor Quintar Taylor focuses on African American history in terms of forming communities, combating racism, and changing social and political patterns in the development of the American West. The African American West is presented by the University of Washington's College of Arts and Sciences and the UW Alumni Association. Major funding for this program was provided by Macy's, continuing its long-term commitment to promoting black history by making this video series available to secondary schools throughout Washington State. Additional funding was provided by the University Bookstore and UW Medicine. In this talk, Professor Taylor examines the paradox of race and freedom in the West in the period leading up to and including the Civil War. Good evening, everyone. My name is David Hodge, and I'm the very proud Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences tonight. It's my pleasure to introduce you to the first of this wonderful lecture series on the African American West, 1528 to 2000. It's great to see so many alumni and friends, um, students and faculty, the greater community here tonight to enjoy this series. This is the 34th year in which we have offered these special lecture series by the History Department, and it is with great pride that the College of Arts and Sciences and the Alumni Association bring this series to you this winter. Now, I want especially to take a moment to thank those of you who are members of the Alumni Association. Uh, your participation in the association and your donations make it possible not only to host this series, but part of your membership goes to provide scholarships for history students. So we're very pleased about that. This series features an outstanding scholar and teacher here at the University of Washington. Professor Quintard Taylor has taught and written about the history of African Americans for over 30 years, specializing in the American West. Over the next several weeks, we will explore much of what students learn in a full quarter or more under his tutelage. During these weeks, Professor Taylor will challenge myths and ask us to think critically about the diverse ancestry that lies in our collective past. It brings us to a common purpose of deepening our understanding of the experiences of all Americans and all persons of the West and expanding our respect and understanding for our different cultures and histories. Professor Taylor was originally from Brownsville, Tennessee, received his undergraduate degree from St. Augustine's College in Raleigh, North Carolina, and his graduate degrees from the University of Minnesota. Professor Taylor joined the UW faculty in 1999 after his previous appointments at WSU, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, and just before the University of Washington, the University of Oregon, 1990 to 1999. Professor Taylor is the author of more than 50 scholarly articles and four books. He holds the Scott and Dorothy Bullitt Chair of American History, which was established in 1979. This is the oldest and one of the most prestigious faculty endowments in the college. In addition to an expectation of extraordinary scholarship, the holder of the bullet chair is expected to devote a substantial portion of his or her working time to teaching undergraduate students, something Professor Taylor has done truly exceptionally well. Professor Taylor serves on the Council of the American Historical Society as well as the Washington State Historical Society, the Washington Territorial Commission, and HistoryLink Interactive History Project. He was a founding member of the Central District Forum for Arts and Ideas. We are absolutely delighted to have such a distinguished individual as part of the faculty of the University of Washington, and we are especially delighted to have this opportunity to share him with you. Please join me in welcoming Professor Quintard Taylor. Thank, thank you, thank you. I'm, we have a lot to cover tonight. I'm, I'm going to treat you as my students for the next five weeks, okay? Fortunately, you don't have to take my exams. 
Uh, you can just sit and listen and you will all get A's, <laughs> which is probably the best, best approach. Uh, I, I do want to say that I, I really do appreciate and I'm humbled by the fact that I've been invited to be a part of this lecture series. This is a very important lecture series, as the dean has indicated, it's gone on for 34 years, and there have been some illustrious predecessors, including uh, my dear colleague and friend, Bob Stacy, who's somewhere in the audience. Bob did a wonderful job last year. I won't match him this year, but I'll do my best. Um, I, I also want to uh, make a very special acknowledgement uh, tonight I am dedicating not only this lecture, but all of the lectures to a wonderful woman, a true friend, who is no longer with, her, with us. Her name is Mrs. Constance Thomas, and in 1972, she was one of the first people that I interviewed here in Seattle in the process of reconstructing the history of African Americans in the West. I had, I had hoped that Mrs. Thomas would be here, at least in spirit, uh, if not in, uh, presently, but un unfortunately she is not because she passed on January 7th of this year. All of the lectures, as I said before, are dedicated to her. I will acknowledge her son, Ken Thomas, who I've known for 30 some years, who's in the audience. Ken, can you stand up for just one minute? I, I say this because, uh, I'm not standing here uh, alone being responsible for all that you'll hear tonight. What you will hear has come, will come through my mouth tonight, will come through my voice tonight, but it's essentially the words of literally hundreds if not thousands of African Americans and others who have been part of the process of the history of blacks in this region. I hope you will hear those voices carefully. I hope you will hear those voices proudly because they certainly still speak to me. Maybe at, by the end of this lecture, uh, they will speak to all of you as well. I began this five-part lecture series on the African-American West with a simple premise. There is no single African-American historical experience. The lives and histories of blacks in Mississippi or Harlem tell us much about the challenges that African Americans have faced over, over the last three centuries. But their stories are incomplete. They paint an incomplete picture unless and until we know what happened elsewhere in the nation, including the American West. Indeed, we need to know about blacks and their experiences in Helena, Montana, in Phoenix, Arizona, in Seattle, and yes, even in Bellevue, Washington. Uh, often blacks in, in Seattle, and I'm going to uh, put the onus on the local population here, myself included, often we blacks here in Seattle, people who live in the Central District or the Rainier Valley, wrap ourselves in what I call the authenticity banner. We claim that our experiences are truer to the black world than those of our Bellevue cousins. Yet if an African American grew up in Bellevue, and increasingly black folks are growing up in Bellevue, because one of the things you're going to learn is that the majority of black people today in the greater Seattle area live outside of the city of Seattle. Yet if an African American grew up in Bellevue, that is his or her African American experience, and it is as valid as that of someone reared in Harlem or Georgia. But I think the reason for the absence of the Bellevue discussion is that when we historians describe race in the history of the American West, black people are usually left out of the discourse completely. Asian American, Latino, or Native American history are automatically, and I believe correctly, considered Western in orientation, but not black history in this region. In fact, one of the founders of Western history, a man named Walter Prescott Webb, wrote in 1957 that the West is the American region without water, timber, cities, or Negroes. Obviously, Webb didn't come to the Pacific Northwest. This lecture series is intended to challenge Webb's idea. It is easy to ignore the African-American historical experience uh, in this region because of its concentration, or that is the concentration of contemporary black populations in the major cities, such as San Francisco and Oakland and certainly Los Angeles and to a lesser extent Seattle. But if we define the West as that region of the country, uh, beginning with the states that straddle the 98th meridian and that stretch all the way to the Pacific, then as early as 1870, 284,000 African Americans lived in this region, and they comprised 12% of the region's population. As of the year 2000, there were 6.5 million black Westerners, 
who were 9% of the region's total. They were over, also, they were over 90% urbanized. Indeed, I had an interesting encounter uh, when I gave a presentation at the University of Idaho a few years ago. Uh, I, I had given a, uh, a talk on the Black West, and a co-ed walked up to me and she said, yes, this is all good, this is all true, I, I, I assume, but I've never seen a black person in Idaho, so how can you make the argument <laughs> that, they're, that the blacks are part of the West? And I reminded her that in the contemporary world, there are far more blacks in Los Angeles County than there are people in the entire state of Idaho. <laughs> in other words, we are very much a concentrated people uh, today. Yet if we look into the 19th century, we will find that blacks were far more dispersed throughout the region. In 1890, for example, black people lived in every single county in the state of Washington. And indeed, they lived in small towns that you wouldn't identify with black folks or black history today. Places like Roslyn, Washington. And actually, Roslyn at one time had a black majority, but that's the subject of another lecture. There was Winlock, uh, uh, a friend of mine is doing research on Winlock, Washington. I'm not sure many of you even know what Winlock is. It's on the way to, to Portland. And of course, there's Pomeroy, Washington. And we could go on and on and on with these various places all over, all over the state of Washington. But reconstructing black Western history is imperative, not simply because of the number of people in the region. Now that diversity is the watchword for social and racial progress in this nation, the West affords us, I believe, a very special opportunity for examining multiculturalism and diversity in a historical context. Indeed, the West is today, and has always been, the most multicultural region of the nation. It is the only region where Asian Americans, Latinos, Native Americans, and African Americans have existed in significant numbers along with Anglos. Indeed, the very variety of races was crucial to, to the creation of the modern West. Without it, as my former colleague Richard White remarked, the region, meaning the West, might as well be New Jersey with mountains. <laughs> Finally, these, these lectures will, I hope, answer one major question. Was the West, was the West significantly different for African Americans than the South or the East? Was there a racial frontier beyond which African Americans could experience both freedom and opportunity? I believe the answer is both yes and no. It is yes, as in the success of post-Civil War Western blacks in gaining and keeping voting rights in every single state and territory with the exception of Texas. But it also must be no if we consider the emergence of postbellum discriminatory legislation symbolized by anti-miscegenation statutes and public school segregation in states as diverse as Montana, Arizona, Kansas, and even neighboring Oregon. In other words, when we talk about school segregation, we're not just talking about Mississippi and Alabama. We're often talking about what happened in states uh, that are on the borders of Washington. In fact, Washington provides an interesting footnote. It is one of six states in the entire country that did not have segregated schools written into its laws in, uh, in the 1880s and 1890s. Such ambiguity arising from African American history in the West surely complicates the region's past. That complication begins with the first question that we will address tonight, the nature of slavery and freedom in the West. Now, I don't believe that most of us, most of us who are now Westerners, think about slavery when we imagine the American West. When the Civil War began in 1861, only four Western states had been admitted to the Union, Texas, California, Oregon, and of course, Kansas. And only one, as you all know, Texas, seceded to join the Confederacy. Yet I argue that the West's claims of innocence on slavery are, are muted by the presence of black bond servants, black slaves, in every state and territory in this region prior to the Civil War, including, including Washington Territory. Consider, for example, the case of Charles Mitchell. And I knew I would have some difficulty with this. Uh, Charles's brother, Paul, is in the audience. Uh, that's not the Charles Mitchell I'm talking about. He's not the contemporary Charles Mitchell. is not the one we're talking about. The Charles Mitchell that I'm referring to is a 14-year-old boy from Olympia, Washington, who in 1860 stole away on a steamer, the Elijah Anderson, to Victoria, British Columbia. And he did so because he was running away from his master Major James Tilton of Olympia. Major Tilton was not only a prominent citizen in Olympia, he was the surveyor general for the Washington Territory at the time. 
Uh, Charles Mitchell uh, was discovered on the ship as it made its way up the Pusic Sound. I couldn't find a better map, so I've got a road map of Western Washington here. But imagine the ship, folks. Use your mind's eye. Imagine the ship making its way from Olympia all the way up to Victoria, and somewhere, maybe by Seattle, Charles Mitchell is, is discovered. And he is, he is confined to a cabin. And it's there that presumably he will stay until he's returned to Olympia and to his master. But, but there are other people who have different ideas. Somehow or another abolitionists in Victoria, BC, gain word, find out that Charles Mitchell was in this ship, that he's being held prisoner. And as a result, when the, ships, when the ship docks in Victoria, they present themselves along with the sheriff, and Charles Mitchell is arrested and taken into custody. He is then almost immediately brought before a judge in British Columbia, and the judge says that since, since Mitchell is now on British soil, British territory, where, of course, slavery is illegal, Mitchell is henceforth forever free. Folks, Charles Mitchell stole away, and luckily, he was able to gain his freedom. Not everybody was pleased with this. There were, there were anti-Canada editorials, anti-British editorials, and certainly anti-abolitionist editorials that would appear in a number of newspapers up and down the Puget Sound, including Olympia, obviously, but also Stilicon. People raise the question, how dare the British and how dare these abolitionists interfere with the property of, of an American citizen? Nonetheless, nonetheless, nothing was done despite the fact that these editorials called for American federal or federal intervention, called for an American note of protest, and maybe even military action. Nothing was done, of course, because this was September of 1860, and soon the entire nation, that is the United States, would be engulfed in the Civil War. Nonetheless, the case of Charles Mitchell shows us that slavery touched our own shores uh, right here in Washington. And indeed, I'm going to refer you to uh, the, the slide on the, on the screen. A. Ludlow Kramer, many of you may know him or may remember him, uh, in 1969 was the, uh, the chairman of the Washington State Commission on the Causes and Prevention of Civil Disorder. As you, some of you may know, Washington had race riots, Seattle especially had race riots in 1967, 1968. There was a commission put together to investigate it. Ludlow Kramer was the, uh, was the chair of the commission. And this is part of what he wrote in, in the preface or the introduction uh, to, to that report. He didn't have Charles Mitchell in mind. But I wanted to include that statement because, in effect, his words sort of resonate with, with that Charles Mitchell story. That indeed, as I said before, slavery touches every corner, every corner of the West, including us right here in Washington, Washington State. Slavery was legal. Slavery was legal in Texas, in the Indian Territory, and in Utah Territory. However, it existed illegally everywhere else, including, of course, in Washington Territory. The 98th Meridian might have represented the farthest advance of slave-dominated plantation agriculture as it, was, as it was practiced in the Old South. We often think of plantations of cotton fields or plantations of sugarcane, but it did not. It, that is, the 98th Meridian, the environmental factors, did not pose an insurmountable barrier to the development of the servile institution in the West. Note, for example, that there were, in the 1850s, slave cowboys in Texas. Indeed, our best evidence suggests that most of the cowboys in Texas were, in fact, slaves. Note, for example, that one-third of the 900 blacks who participated in the gold mine rush in California in 1855, that is, one-third of the blacks who were mining gold, were, in fact, slaves. Let me repeat that. One-third of the blacks who mined gold in California were, in fact, slaves. Note that there were slaves in Berkeley who would be freed by abolitionists in Oakland. I know, this is not the image that we have of California. This is not the image that we, that, that we have of the West. But nonetheless, this was the situation that has evolved. The West was not saved from slavery by any natural environmental barrier, as historians have long argued, or any particular commitment by Westerners to universal liberty. Rather, free soil uh, farmers, mostly white farmers, wanted to end slavery for their own region, uh, reasons. And indeed, many of these free soilers were as anti-black as they were anti-slavery. Take, for example, Peter H. Burnett, who was born in Tennessee, but he eventually becomes a leader in the Oregon uh, legislature. 
He is responsible for many of the anti-black laws that are instituted in Oregon. And of course, he moves to California and he becomes responsible for similar legislation in, in California. But there were also white men in the West who, in fact, wanted a different outcome. Men such as John Brown and Leland Stanford, who were dedicated to the abolition of slavery in the West. John Brown, for instance, and other white Kansans would go into Missouri to free slaves. We'll say more about that later on in the lecture. Moreover, as we shall see tonight, black women and black men played a major part in the destruction of slavery in this region. I think we should also note the complexity of the slavery issue in the West. The West is the only region of the country where Native Americans practice large-scale black slavery in the Indian Territory. Yet only a few, only about five or six of the 500 or so Indian tribes actually owned slaves. But the West also contained uh, New Mexico, where Indian slavery and Mexican peonage uh, precluded the need for black enslavement. In other words, because Indians were enslaved in New Mexico, black people were not going to be enslaved in, in that territory. African slavery in the West begins in New Spain. Nearly 200,000 Africans entered Mexico during the colonial period, and that, that, by that I mean 1521 to 1821. That's a figure that's comparable to the 345,000 who were brought to British North America. And of course, you all know that the 345,000 brought to British North America became the basis for much of the contemporary African-American population today. But unlike the British mainland colonies where large scale, uh, excuse me, unlike the British mainland colonies, large scale intermarriage in New Spain produced a biracial population that soon constituted the vast majority of persons of African descent. The multi-race, that is African, Spanish, and Indian population grew much more rapidly than the unmixed black population rising from 2400, as you can see on this table, 2400 in 1570 up to 369,000 in 1793. Spanish slavery existed in, uh, or slavery existed in New Spain, but it certainly was a far cry from the kind of slavery that existed in British North America. Slavery la rarely lasted for any Africans in New Spain more than one generation. Indeed, the mostly African male slaves who were brought to New Spain quickly realized that they could ensure that their progeny would be outside of the bounds of slavery simply by taking an Indian wife, or in some instances by taking a, a Spanish wife. But I would also argue that slavery was made unnecessary by the abundance of coerced Indian labor. In other words, slavery would never be as crucial, it would be important, but it would never be as crucial to the colonial economy in New Spain as it would be in Virginia or Maryland or South Carolina. Frontier conditions in northern New Spain also made slavery even less of an issue, even less practical. In 1800, there were 40 blacks, quote unquote, in San Antonio. That doesn't include the people who were mixed race. There were 40 blacks in San Antonio. Of those 40 blacks, only six were slaves. If the Spanish colonial policies, however inadvertently, promoted upward social mobility uh, and political mobility among people of color, the Mexican War of Independence enshrined the concept in the Constitution and in the basic laws of the new nation. Mexico's Constitution of 1821 renounced black slavery and proclaimed political equality for all of the nation's inhabitants. The promise of freedom and equality proved the powerful attraction for fugitive slaves and free blacks from the states, that is, from the United States. The Sabin River became a political and racial frontier uh, for a small number of intrepid African Americans who arrived in Mexican Texas in the 1820s. Now, of course, many of these blacks were fugitive slaves from neighboring Louisiana or from the Arkansas Territory or from as far away as Mississippi. But I would also argue that a good number of these blacks who made their way to Mexican Texas were, were in effect free blacks who were seeking out Mexican liberty. Let me give you an example. Samuel H. Hardin, a man who claimed to be a descendant of the first president of the United States, was an African-American, a mulatto. Uh, he was a barber in Virginia. But in 1822, he and his wife migrated, or I should say immigrated, to Texas, to Mexican Texas. And he left these words for us. He tells us why he immigrated. He said, and I'm quoting here, Mexico's laws invited our immigration 
and guaranteed our right to own property. Folks, just to put this in, con in, in some, some form of contrast, the rights of free blacks, quote unquote, uh, were diminishing in the period between 1800 and 1860. In other words, with each passing year, free blacks, even in the North, and certainly free blacks in the South, found that they had fewer and fewer uh, rights. The warm views that blacks held toward uh, Mexican Texas were reinforced by the attitude of the government in Mexico City. Mexico's vice president at the time, that is in 1833, Vice President Valentin Gomez Farias, for example, supported the relocation of former slaves in Mexico. Gomez wrote in 1833, if they, meaning the US blacks, would like to come, we will offer them land for cultivation, plots for houses where they can establish towns, and tools for work under the obligation that they obey the laws of the country. Under the obligation that they obey the laws of the country. Yet I would suggest to you that the aspirations of free blacks and their supporters for a racially tolerant Texas soon conflicted with the desires of Southern whites to transform Mexico into, as one historian called, an empire for slavery. In 1821, Mexican Texas had only 3,200 non-Indian inhabitants. Concerned about the region's vulnerability to annexation, ironically, to the United States, and also the France or Great Britain, the, the, uh, the Mexican government granted Moses Austin permission to settle a colony of American-born immigrants loyal to Mexico along the Brazos and Colorado rivers. And you can see Austin's colony on, on the map here. When Moses Austin died, Stephen Austin, his son, took over the enterprise. The prospect of free land lured European Americans across the Sabin and Red Rivers. As early as 1823, perhaps 3,000 U.S. citizens had entered Texas illegally and in addition, in addition to 700 legitimate settlers. I always make an aside here. We always talk about the problem of illegal aliens. And we always talk about how that problem is, is one directed toward Mexico as Mexicans move north. The first illegal aliens in Texas, the first illegal aliens in Texas came across the Red River in the Sabin from the, United, uh, from the United States. And indeed, they came despite the best efforts of the Mexican army to patrol the border. But these slaves brought, excuse me, these men, for the most part, they were men. These men brought slaves. Jared E. Grossi of Georgia, for example, arrived in, in central Texas in 1822, and he brought with him 90 slaves. These slaves established Bernardo, a cotton plantation along the Brazos River. Grossi, like many of the subsequent arrivals, was convinced that the cash crop, the labor system, and the social relations of the U.S. South, all of which rested on black slavery, could be easily replicated in the bottomlands of the Colorado and the Brazos. And he wasn't by himself in that thinking. Eventually, there would be others who would come. By 1835, Texas slaveholders had duplicated the slave system of the United, of the United States. By that date, there were 35,000 immigrants from the United States and Mexican Texas, including a good number who were illegals. Uh, but that included 5,000 black slaves who were 12% of the population. Indeed, although slavery is theoretically illegal in Mexico, the number of black slaves in Texas was actually greater than the number of Spanish-speaking Mexican citizens. Let me repeat that. The number of black slaves was greater than the number of Mexicans, the number of Spanish-speaking Mexicans. There were only 3,500 3, Mexicans in Texas at that time. The growing numbers of slaveholders demanding the protection of their property while openly selling black slaves uh, excuse me, with growing numbers of slaveholders demanding the protection of their property while openly selling black slaves, that is against the law, anglo Texans and the Mexican government were soon on a collision that would lead to the Alamo. Here you see a map showing uh, the, the, if you will, the battle for Texas independence. I don't call it the Texas Revolution because I assume the revolutions overturned the existing social order. In this particular instance, there was an attempt to try to if you will, establish an old order in the Old South in, in a new area, in a new region. African Americans would soon be engulfed in the middle of this conflict called the Texas War of Independence. For many Texas slaves, the flag of Mexico, rather than the revolutionary's Lone Star, seemed the banner of liberty. In February of 1836, one month before his siege of the Alamo, General Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana 
commander of the Mexican army, queried government officials in Mexico City about the liberation of the slaves. These are his words. Shall we permit those wretches to moan in chains any longer in a country whose kind laws protect the liberty of man without distinction of caste or color? Santa Ana received the response, which placed the Mexican government clearly on the side of black freedom. On March 18th, the Minister of War, Jose Maria Tornell, wrote, quote, the philanthropy of the Mexican nation has already freed the slaves. He then informed the commanding general to grant these slaves their natural rights, including the liberty to go any point on the globe that appeals to them or to remain in Texas or any other part of Mexico. The Mexican army was poised to become a legion of liberation. As that army marched north and is across the Brazos and the Colorado rivers, moving into the region that was heavily populated by the slaves, the boldest of the bonds people took flight towards Santa Ana's army, both as it marched into Mexico and, or excuse me, and as it marched into Mexican Texas and when they retreated. Anglo slaveholders certainly feared the, quote, abolitionist Mexican army. Soon after the Alamo fell, one Brazor, a Brazoria a slaveholder wrote, quote, our Negroes were on the tiptoe of expectation and rejoicing now that the Mexicans were coming to set them free. In return for Mexican protection, these fugitives served as spies and messengers or provocateurs for their liberators. For every Mexican, excuse me, for every slave that fled to the Mexican lines, far more took advantage of the confusion and the turmoil of the fighting to make good their escape. Some of the slaves, and these were perhaps the bravest of them all, decided to take their chances with the Comanche and the Comancheros in the West. Far more slaves, though, made their way south to the colony, the black, what would be the fugitive slave colony at Matamoros, which is just south of the Rio Grande. The victory of the Texas revolutionaries over the Mexican army set in motion political forces that in the next decade succeeded in adding all of Mexico's northern territories to the United States. You know this as the Mexican-American War, which would eventually result in the annexation of California and Arizona and New Mexico and a host of other areas in the Southwest. But I would suggest to you that that War of Independence, the Texas War of Independence, also initiated the status decline of free blacks who had previously sought refuge in Texas. Moreover, it fixed African slavery as the predominant labor system in the area. The Texas Constitution, the, the Constitution of the Texas Republic in 1837 was very clear, un, unequivocal on slavery. You can see what it says here. I would also argue that it was, it was equally unequivocal on free blacks. Remember, free blacks have been coming to Texas since 1821, but now they wouldn't have a place. Let me give you examples of this. The Texas Constitution said that citizenship rights shall be granted to all in Texas except, except Africans, descendants of Africans, and Indians. The Constitution also said that no free person of African descent shall be permitted to reside permanently in the Texas Republic without the consent of the Texas Congress. Folks, it's no wonder then that by the time Texas became a state in 1845, there were virtually no free blacks. And indeed, all the way up until the time of the Civil War, the free black population would either be the smallest or the second smallest in all of the slaveholding states of America. The future of slaves, of course, was certain. With the guarantee of governmental protection, Texas's peculiar institution grew from 3,000 African Americans held in bondage in 1835 to a quarter of a million slaves three decades later. Texas thus became the first place where the Old South met the Western frontier. And as such, it became the heart of slavery. What do I mean by this? Texas would have by far the largest slave population. The 1860 US Census reported that there were 182,000 bonds people comprising slightly over 30% of the state's total population. Let me put this in perspective. Blacks were one third of the population of Texas in 1860. Blacks today are probably 12% of the population of Texas. In other words, African people of African ancestry were a much higher percentage of Texas at that time. Indeed, as you can see from this map, there were a number of counties, I think there were about 13 or 14 counties in East Texas and in, in South Central Texas that were predominantly black. 
In other words, we're talking about an institution, the institution of slavery, that was going to become significantly fixed onto the Texas landscape. Texas slaveholders boldly proclaimed their right to own their fellow human beings. Let me give you the example of a justification uh, from, uh, from one judge in 1860. By the way, I, I put this up because we always talk, historians talk in terms of statistics, you know, we give you these numbers and these figures. I want you to see the face of slavery in Texas. These are two slaves, uh, two of the thousands, the 182,000 black slaves in Texas. The, the, the woman uh, on, the, uh, on the right is actually a slave in Brownsville, Texas. That's as far south as you can go and still be in Texas and still be, in fact, uh, in the United States. Yet I would argue, I would argue that slavery was never completely secure in the Lone Star State. The problem, as Texas slaveholders were quick, quick to note, was far more, uh, far more of a difficulty than in the Old South. Texas, despite its vast size, or maybe because of its vast size, uh, was bordered on three sides by places that offered opportunities for flight. First, there was Indian territory to the north. Not that Indian territory wasn't a slave territory, but there were vast tracts of land in Indian territory where one could, could go, where one could literally live as a, a quasi-free person. Then, of course, there was the West, and we've already mentioned those who took their chances to go with the Comancheros and the Comanches and the Apaches. But most importantly, there was Mexico to the South. Indeed, these two statements reflect the role of Mexico in the thinking of slaves and in the thinking of slaveholders. Notice these two statements. The first is from Felix Haywood, and you will hear from, them, uh, from him uh, again in this lecture. But also look at the uh, San Antonio Ledger, a pro-slavery paper uh, in 1852, its statement in 1852. And indeed, we don't have time for this, but there is a tremendous amount of effort on the part of Texans to literally try to get back slaves who, were, who have gone into Mexico or to buy Mexico. That is, Texas congressmen use whatever influence they have. I'm glad they're not, they weren't as powerful then as they are now, but they use, use their congressional influence to try to buy, uh, if not all of Mexico, certainly, uh, certainly northern Mexico, in order to take care of the slavery, uh, slavery problem. This view of Mexico, the image of Mexico as a place of refuge, as a haven for fugitive slaves, of course, evolved during the Texas War of Independence. By 1851, 3,000 fugitives lived south of the Rio Grande, and another 1,000 joined them by 1855. But the Civil War ultimately brought an end to bondage in Texas. Because of its remoteness from the major areas of conflict, Texas became a refuge for slaveholders from, rest of the, from, the, uh, from the rest of the South. For example, blacks, oh, excuse me, uh, blacks were brought in from Alabama, black slaves were brought in from Alabama, they were brought in from Tennessee, they were brought in from Mississippi, they were brought in from all over to Texas because Texas slaveholders and those who were bringing them in from the various other states believed that Texas would be the last place where the Union attacked. And in that regard, they were right because Union armies did not reach Texas, did not reach Texas until June 19th, 1865. And of course, that date is going to loom very, very large. On that date, uh, Union forces landed at Galveston, where Major General Gordon Granger issued General Order Number no. 3, which you see on, on the screen there, which e effectively became the Texas Emancipation Proclamation. The day of emancipation from that point on would be called Juneteenth. In other words, we see the birth of what would at first be an African-American holiday and later a holiday for a whole host of people throughout the West and throughout the nation. As news of the emancipation spread throughout Texas, that is, as the Union Army marched across Texas, the vastness of Texas, the reactions were predictable. Obviously, uh, the slaveholders were dejected. Obviously, the, the blacks were elated. Felix Haywood said, and I'm quoting here, soldiers, and he's talking about the Union Army, Soldiers, all of a sudden, was everywhere, coming in bunches, crossing and walking and riding. Everyone was singing. We were all walking on golden clouds, unquote. Yet many newly freed slaves were uncertain about the future that they faced. Listen to the words of Margaret Nillen, who spoke for many of them when she said in 1865, in slavery, I owed nothing. Excuse me. In slavery, I owned nothing. In slavery, I owned nothing. In freedom, I own a house and I raise a family. All this causes me a lot of worriment, and in slavery, I had no worriment. 
but I'll take freedom every day. Let me move our discussion to the next area of, of significant uh, slave ownership, and that was the Indian Territory. Again, this is, this is something that uh, a lot of people find it hard to believe because we have one image of Indians. Well, I'm going to perhaps con uh, contest that image tonight. Like Texas, the five Indian nations, the Cherokees, the Creeks, the Chickasaws, the Choctaws, and the Seminoles, had an economy which rested on slave labor. 7,000 slaves in Indian Territory in 1860 comprised 14% of the total of the population. There were three ways in which blacks were incorporated, had been his historically corp incorporated into Indian nations as slaves. First, there was indigenous slavery among Native Americans, among the Cherokee and the Creek, where, where the Cherokee and the Creek had held other Indians or Indians from other tribes, and then eventually they began to hold blacks in much the same manner. But there were also blacks who were sold or given to Indians, particularly in the Southeast, in the 1700s. And usually this was a way of paying debts. And as a result, black slavery was introduced subtly into the Indian nations. But the major process by which black slavery came to Indian uh, nations was when white traders married into Indian populations, usually when they married into Indian elites, and they brought with them their slaves. And as a result, those slaves would be handed down to the descendants of, of these traders and the Indian women that they married. This was the most likely path, and it was also the basis, unfortunately, for growing class divisions between and among the Indian peoples who held slaves. Indeed, the ownership of black slaves was a sign of two things for Native Americans. First, it was a sign of the conversion, quote unquote, to civilization. And secondly, it was a sign of status and wealth, much like it was in the Old South. But slavery was strengthened and indeed made, uh, made even more difficult for African Americans by one of the most ironic of experiences, the Trail of Tears. You all know, most of you know something about the history of the Trail of Tears, and you know this as an arduous uh, struggle, an arduous, a difficult situation for Native Americans. You know, you probably know the statistics, more Native Americans died along the Trail of Tears than were killed in all the, quote, Indian wars the nation had fought up until that time. But what you probably don't know is that a good number of those Native Americans, those 60,000 Native Americans who came west over the Trail of, Trail of Tears were actually black slaves. Uh, typical of these slaves were the ones who belonged to the George Lowry family. George Lowry was a, a Cherokee slaveholder. He left his home in Georgia in September of 1838. He left what he termed a comfortable estate in Georgia for the, for the trek to the Indian Territory. Now, I don't, I don't doubt that it wasn't difficult for him, and I don't doubt that he was resentful of the fact that he had to leave his comfortable home. But George Lowry was at a much greater advantage than most Indians who made the trek to Oklahoma or to Indian Territory because he brought with him slaves. He brought with him slaves. Five months later, Lowry settled eight miles south of Tolika, uh, the capital of the Western Cherokee Nation, and there his slaves soon had several hundred acres of land under cultivation. I want to show this next slide. These are two contrasting images uh, of the slave system in Oklahoma. What you see on the left is an Indian slaveholder's house. It looks like the typical plantation house that you see in the South. What you see on the right is a slave cabin, which also looks like the typical slave cabin that, you, that you'll see in the South. Eventually, Lowry constructed a substantial house. This is not his house, but he, more than likely he constructed a house very much like this, a substantial house, now on a plantation that he called the Greenleaf Plantation. With slave labor, Indian planters in the West could clear more acreage and make more improvements on their land than those Indians who were too poor to own slaves. Uh, the work of black slaves in the Indian Territory differed little from the tasks of bond servants in the slaveholding states such as Texas or Alabama or Mississippi. I'm not going to go through all of this, but essentially black men uh, cleared land. They worked in the fields. They cultivated the, the vegetables, the rice, the corn, and increasingly the cotton. Black women uh, cooked. They operated uh, spinning wheels. They cleaned plantation houses. They cared for children. The wealthier Indians had slave coachmen and butlers. Black slaves were also stevedores who loaded and unloaded the ships and the steamboats that operated in the Indian, Indian Territory. 
Slaves in Indian territory, however, were different in a couple of important regards uh, from those slaves who existed in what I call the Old South. First, because many of these black slaves understood and spoke English, they often became the interpreters, or as the Indians would say, the linksters, the linksters uh, between Indian peoples and, um, and uh, English-speaking peoples, uh, usually the whites. Uh, and among the Seminole Indians, their black slaves understood not just English, but they also understood Spanish, and they spoke, obviously, the Seminole language. Of course, not all African Americans uh, who were slaves of the Indians were bilingual or bicultural. Some of these families had been among the Indians for generations, and they, in effect, became black Indians. And when I say they became black Indians, I mean they adopted the Indian dress, they followed the Indian diet, they used native medicine, they practiced Indian modes of agriculture. They even celebrated Indian holidays. These are uh, Choctaw slaves uh, uh, in, well, ex-slaves in this instance, in 1866. This is a picture taken right after, right after the Civil War. As in Texas, the Civil War brought freedom to the Indians uh, who, uh, to the Indian-owned black slaves. But unlike Texas, unlike the Texas situation, their liberation, that is the liberation of blacks in the Indian territory, came long before the end of the war. Indian nations divided, quickly divided between pro-Union and pro-Confederate supporters, and thus they created a little civil war going on throughout the Indian territory. Indeed, a lot of people don't realize this, but proportionally more people were killed doing the fighting in the Indian territory than in any other state or territory in the nation. Let me repeat that. We think about the numbers of people who were killed in Tennessee or Virginia uh, or, or at Gettysburg, but in proportion to their population, more people were killed in the Indian Territory than in any state or any other territory during, uh, during the time of the Civil War. By the fall of 1861, one Confederate Cherokee Indian regiment had been founded under Stan Wate. By the end of 1861, a Union regiment uh, uh, for the Cherokees was created under John Drew. Drew's regiment, Drew's Indian regiment, eventually had 1,000 men, and those 1,000 men included black men, included ex-slaves. In other words, this was one of the ways in which black slaves of the Indians uh, could get out of slavery. Indeed, Drew was very proud of the fact that he issued a call that, and I'm, that was fairly long, but I'm going to quote just part of it. The call said that all persons, without reference to color, who are willing to fight for the American flag and the federal government should join his regiment, should join this group of Indian soldiers. Think about this, Indian soldiers, but indeed, many of those Indian soldiers are actually, are actually black men. By 1863, about 10,000 Cherokees remained loyal to the United States and 7,000 supported the Confederacy. If the Indians were divided between the Confederacy and the Union causes, black slaves in the Indian country faced no such dilemma. Even before the Emancipation Proclamation went into effect, Major A.C. Ellenthorpe, the white commander of the first Indian Home Guard, said, and I'm quote here, the Negroes in the territory have somehow become impressed with the idea that the war is being waged on their account. And that for the present time, their shackles will fall and their race will be free. This was said in 1861, two years before the Emancipation Proclamation. I don't know if the Native Americans and the Indians, uh, excuse me, and the blacks who were slaves of the Native Americans knew something that we didn't, but they, they were very perceptive. They understood that this was going to be a war uh, for liberation. These fugitives became soldiers. Uh, and of course, I want to I explain the, the, uh, the slide on the, on the screen. This is Silas Jefferson, who is a member of the first Indian Home Guard. The first Indian Home Guard was one of those Indi Indian regiments created, in this instance, with the Creeks, not with the Cherokees, but with the Creeks. What is ironic, and, and I'm sorry you can't read the descriptive book on the right, but what is ironic about the first Indian Home Guards is that 40% of these Indian, uh, these Indian soldiers were, in effect, former black slaves. 40% of these, quote, Indian soldiers were former black slaves. In other words, the, these regiments that were being created in the West uh, were far more integrated 
than any regiments that would be created in the East, despite all the discussion of glory and all, the, all of that in, 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 in entails. Thousands of other blacks uh, would join the, the cause and join the fight in the Indian Territory, and they would be involved in battles such as Cabin Creek. I won't go down the, the entire list, but Honey Springs and Cabin Creek in Arkansas and Indian Territory, respectively, and they would help to break the power of the Confederacy in the West. But more than breaking the power of the Confederacy, they would, in effect, gain their freedom. In other words, those, those who became soldiers in the Union Army automatically became free, and their families often followed them in the freedom. And, and of course, the, the, the disruption that was going on all over Indian Territory created a situation whereby uh, slaves and now ex-slaves literally had taken their liberty by simply walking away from the plantations. Thus, when the fighting ended in 1865 in the Indian Territory, and by the way, it ended the last Confederate general to surrender during the Civil War was General Stan Wate in August of 1865. Uh, when the fighting ended in Indian Territory, there wasn't a single slave left. Indeed, slavery had, had died, or slavery had been destroyed uh, long before. This is the Cherokee National Council Act of Emancipation. This is in 1863, but I suggest that slavery was dying uh, in 1863, and indeed, it was dying long before in the Indian Territory if it were only that simple in the rest of the Old South. I want to uh, shift our attention, shift our focus to the other areas of the West that uh, did not have, well, actually, that theoretically should not have had slaves, but in point of fact, actually had slavery. And I want to talk about the way in which slavery was contested. That is, the, those, those people who were going to be involved in the process of challenging slavery in those areas. Obviously, there were very few people who could successfully contest slavery in Texas. And there were some Indian abolitionists. And certainly, they came to the fore in the, in the Civil War. Uh, but for the most part, slavery was not contested in the Indian, Indian territory. But it would be in other areas. Areas. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to abbreviate some of the discussion, and one of the areas I'm going to cut out is Oregon. I'm, so <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, but I, but I do want to show you a couple of the images that reflect on the, uh, the nature of slavery elsewhere in the West. Remember we said the slavery was uh, legal in one other area, one other territory in the West, and that strangely, at least for me, strangely, was Utah. The, Mor the Mormons embraced slavery. Uh, and indeed, I wish we had more time to talk about this. This, is, this slide, this image depicts the Mormon uh, migration. And of course, among those uh, who came with the original Brigham Young Party, the party that reached Salt Lake, the Salt Lake Valley in 1847, among that, uh, that party were three black slaves, including a man who allegedly was, uh, was Brigham Young's personal bodyguard, and that man is on the right here. His name, strangely enough, Green Flake. I had the, I had the distinct uh, pleasure of interviewing his granddaughter in Pocatello, Idaho, in 1973. She and her family are still devout Mormons to this day, and that, and that was one of the things that I think uh, made me realize that the West is different in so many ways, and certainly the African American experience is different in so many ways, because I began to encounter a number of blacks who were Mormon, despite the, despite the difficulties, as many of you know, in that church, despite the, the prejudice and discrimination. These are actually Mormon pioneers, and as you can see on the, on the lower photograph, there's a black woman right in the middle. She was uh, she was actually a friend of Joseph Smith. Uh, she came out to Utah in 1848, and indeed, you'll, you'll encounter other blacks who had slightly different experiences with the Mormon church and, and the West. There was also slavery in Oregon. And again, I know this seems hard to imagine, very, very difficult to imagine, uh, but there were those who came from Missouri and Tennessee and other areas in the South who brought their slaves with them. And even though slavery was never fully established, certainly never legally established in Oregon, uh, slaves were nonetheless present. I, as, as the dean indicated, I taught in Lane, oh, excuse me, I taught, I taught at the University of Oregon. The University of Oregon is located in Eugene, Oregon, and Eugene uh, is in a county that's named after uh, Joseph Lane. And Joseph Lane, interestingly, was the vice presidential candidate on what was called the Southern Party ticket in 18, 1860. But he was also a slaveholder and very proud of it. And he kept slaves, a few slaves, 
in the Eugene area almost up until the time, uh, well, actually even after, even after slavery had officially ended, he kept a black man as a body servant, I guess informally up until the time of his death. Uh, there were numerous other examples of slaves in, in Oregon. Indeed, there, you, know, you know that there are slave narratives. Uh, those narratives have been collected. Uh, there, is one, there is one compilation of slave narratives uh, for Oregon. And these two, Lou Southworth and Mary Jane Shipley, are former, Shipley Drake, are former slaves uh, in Oregon. But, but that's not the area in which the slavery was going to be contested. Indeed, there were relatively few uh, slaves in both Utah and Oregon. There would be a much larger number of black slaves held illegally in California. And California ultimately represents the best example of the attempt to establish slavery and the successful defeat of that attempt. That is, there would be those who would rise to the fore uh, to try to make sure the slavery would not, would not plant itself in California. Throughout the 1850s, Southern slaveholders brought their bond service into California to work in the gold fields and in the cities. Uh, but California slaveholders did not anticipate the role that a dedicated minority of black and white abolitionists would play in undermining the peculiar institution in this region, that is, in California. Throughout the 1850s, California slaves and anti-slavery activists literally worked side by side in the mining fields or on the city streets. This close proximity of slave and abolitionists exposed the bond servants to direct contact with their champions, a position that was impossible in the eastern United States. In other words, think about the abolitionist movement and think about the pro-slavery movement. Those who were pro-slavery, for the most part, were in the South. Those who were pro-slavery were, uh, were in the overwhelming majority, and there was very little dissent against the pro-slavery position in most states in the South. By the same token, at least by, let's say, the 1850s, the late 1850s, abolitionist sentiment, or at least anti-slavery sentiment, and I, I do make a distinction between the two, anti-slavery sentiment was overwhelming in the North. Imagine both Northerners and Southerners, though, coming to California in the gold rush and occupying the same ground. And that's where slavery becomes contested. That's where uh, the question of whether or not slavery is going to exist becomes an immediate question, not a theoretical question as being debated by Boston intellectuals as opposed to Charleston intellectuals, but a real and practical question uh, debated by people who saw each other on, on, on the streets of California, the streets of the cities of California. California's 4,000 African Americans became caught up in the struggle. As I've already indicated, about one-fourth of them were actually bond servants or slaves, even though theoretically, theoretically slavery didn't exist. However, those blacks who were not slaves, those blacks who for the most part were from the northern states, were going to do everything they could to try to break free their brethren, to try to make sure that slavery would not take deep roots uh, in the south, or excuse me, in, in California. Understand these, these blacks who came uh, to California at the time. California was the only state in the antebellum United States where freeborn men and women from northern states, such as Massachusetts, New York, Illinois, and Ohio, literally rubbed shoulders with slaves from Georgia, Alabama, and Tennessee, and Texas. But California's black leadership disproportionately was pulled from the north. And increasingly, it was pulled from abolitionist circles. In other words, a number of black abolitionists who had been active in Boston and in New York and in Philadelphia found their, their way to California. And they continued, I, I, I meant to say they continued their struggle. What I should have said was that they intensified their struggle once they got in the midst of, of those who were slaves. But I, I would also add one other uh, uh, point to this, and that's the fact that black Californians had wealth, relatively speaking. Relatively speaking, black Californians had wealth. And it's that wealth that was going to be used to finance a remarkable series of campaigns that would eventually result in the freedom of a number of blacks who were held in bondage. Let me give you an example of that wealth, an example of how that, that wealth came to be, although you can probably figure it out on your own. In December of 1851, a letter from a black gold miner to his wife in St. Genevieve City, Missouri, uh, indicated how California appeared to this, uh, to this person at the time. I'm quoting here, I am now mining about 25 miles from Sacramento City 
and I'm doing well. I have been working for myself for the past two months, and I have cleared $300. Now, folks, you have to understand that $300 is about what uh, many workers would earn in an entire year. California is the best country in the world to make money. It is also the best place for black folks on the globe. All a man has to do is work, and he will make money. Mm, OK. <laughs> OK, but, but you can understand this sentiment. And you can understand for this man, California was going to be the promised land. And I would suggest to you that he and others like him who were successful in the gold fields, because most people were not, whether they were black, white, Asian, or not. But, but he and others who were successful in the gold fields would use this as a basis for wealth uh, to challenge for the freedom of other black folks. Let me give you some examples. Peter Lester and Mifflin Gibbs uh, were two of these black abolitionists in California. Uh, Lester and Gibbs had come from uh, Philadelphia. Uh, they had been prominent in the abolitionist movement back east. But as importantly, they opened the Shoe and Boot Emporium in San Francisco in 1851, and they made a ton of money. They made a great deal of money. Indeed, they sold boots all up and down the West Coast. And Lester especially had become a fairly wealthy man by 1855, and he could have turned his back. He literally could have turned his back on, on slaves. They, after all, were not part of his world. Uh, they did not directly affect his welfare or his well-being. And yet Lester and Mifflin Gibbs decided to, to continue their abolitionist activities and now to bankroll those activities uh, with the profits from, uh, from their shoe store. Peter Lester, for instance, would invite slaves, known slaves, into his house, and he would have, the, well, first of all, he would lecture them uh, on their rights as free people, but more importantly, he would put them in contact with lawyers who were willing to challenge for their freedom. And as Lester uh, wrote, when they left, meaning when they left his home, we had them strong in the spirit of freedom, they were leaving slavery every single day. And what he, what he meant by that was that these people were now uh, imbued with the idea that they indeed could challenge for their freedom, and they now realized that there were others who would help them. Uh, let me give you another example. This is, even to me right now, this is a strange ad. Imagine San Francisco Herald coupled with a runaway slave. It's an image that we don't usually think of. But yet, there were, there were runaways. And of course, if there were runaways and there were ads for runaways, then there must have been slavery. Uh, there must have been slavery as well. Capturing fugitive slaves in California. Again, it's something that you don't normally associate with, uh, with the state of California. California abolitionists, black abolitionists, Mifflin Gibbs, Mary Ellen Pleasant, Peter, uh, Peter Lester. We've already talked about Lester. Let's talk about Mary Ellen Pleasant. And again, I, 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 I apologize to you because we could do a whole lecture on Mary Ellen Pleasant. She was a remarkable woman. Uh, she was free. She had been free all of her life. She, but she was also dedicated to the destruction of slavery. Uh, she came to California from somewhere in the East. And, and she uh, at first began to cook for wealthy miners. And you have to understand that there was this image, and you know, this sort of, sort of stereotypical image that black women could cook better than other folks. And the, the miners were essentially uh, a bachelor society, and so her demand, or excuse me, her, her skills were in great demand. And as a result, she was able to get as much in a week as a cook as many miners earned in the minefields in, in the same period of time. And so as a result, she was able to make a great deal of money. And from that money, she was able to start a series of laundries. We always think of laundries in the Chinese. But the first person to dominate the laundry trade in San Francisco was, was Mary Ellen Pleasant. And from the laundries, she went into real estate. Uh, she eventually owned boarding houses. One of the boarding houses, this gets a little bit ahead of the story, but one of the boarding houses which she owned uh, had a resident who was elected governor of California in 1871 while he was a resident of her house. Uh, and on and on and on. But most importantly, most importantly, I don't want to tire you out with all of this stuff. Most importantly, she was a founder of the Bank of California. She was one of the people who founded the Bank of California. In other words, this is a woman who, by all intents and purposes, was successful. She was successful by any standard. She was certainly one of the wealthiest women, black or white or Asian, uh, anywhere in the West. But even in the 1850s, she devoted herself to the, to the anti-slavery cause. And when I mean devoted herself, I don't mean she just gave money. She literally used the basement of her residence and her various businesses 
uh, to secret away uh, fugitive slaves, to allow them a place for shelter, a place to hide. But as importantly, she used her wealth to, to essentially pay for lawyers uh, who were contest for their freedom. And she used her wealth to, to campaign, to <clears throat> engage in various campaigns to bring about the destruction of slavery, uh, the formal destruction of slavery in California. Mary Ellen Pleasant is a remarkable woman. We haven't said the last about her. We're gonna talk about her when we return to San Francisco in the post-Civil uh, Civil War period because she is going to become involved in a whole host of other activities, uh, some of which are going to, to be quite controversial and remain controversial to this day. And then finally, let me, let me go to the next slide. There is Bridget Biddy Mason. I don't know if anyone and very few people in this room have heard of her. She's another remarkable woman. She was a Mormon slave, that is, or let me put it like this. She was a slave of a Mormon slaveholder who brought her to Utah. And then fortunately for her, he brought her to San Bernardino. And it's in San Bernardino, California, that she decided to, confet, uh, to contest for her freedom. And eventually by 1855, she gained not only her freedom, but the freedom of her extended family of about 18 people. Uh, and this was one of the grand examples of the struggle for freedom uh, in California. Biddy Mason also went on to become, I don't know if it was purposely, but, but certainly by accident, one of the wealthiest women in Los Angeles because she bought land early when Los Angeles had 3,000 people and she waited for the town to grow. <laughs> That's all she had to do, just wait for the town to grow. And she made a great deal of money. And indeed, uh, I find this so ironic. Uh, if you go to Los Angeles, go to downtown Los Angeles, those of you who know Los Angeles will know exactly where I mean. You go to downtown Los Angeles, and across the street from the Ronald Reagan Federal Building is, the, is a series of monuments uh, dedicated to Bridget Biddy Mason, because she, in effect, owned that entire, what is now a commercial block, but uh, that was the original Mason Homestead. It was on the edge of Los Angeles in the 1860s. It is now quite literally in downtown, uh, downtown Los Angeles today. I use these examples, and there are others, but I use these examples to suggest to you that these were people who were engaged in the anti-slavery struggle. They used their wits, they used their wealth to, to challenge slavery every single day. And in the process of doing so, they made slavery much more difficult to be maintained in California. Now, they shouldn't have had to do it because California theoretically is a free state. But unfortunately, that didn't mean anything when there were slaveholders who were dedicated to trying to maintain sla uh, slavery there. I'm going to end this discussion of California with a quote from a German immigrant. Uh, this German remarked in 1857, and I'm quoting here, the wealthy California Negroes exhibit a great deal of energy and intelligence, a great deal of energy and intelligence in saving their brethren. I believe he's exactly right because it's through their struggles that slavery would not take root in California uh, in that period. Let me switch our discussion 2,000 miles to the east, to the other edge of, of the west, of the region that we call the west, and that's Kansas. It's actually the Kansas-Missouri uh, border, and we're going to talk partly about bleeding Kansas, and all of you know that, that term, but we're going to talk about much more uh, than the, the kind of general history that you know about bleeding Kansas. In 1860, Kansas had 627, Kansas Territory, had 627 African Americans. By 1865, it had 12,000. They comprised 9% of the population, a larger percentage of Kansas's population than they do today. They're probably about 3% of the population of Kansas today. Why did this happen? Well, in some ways, the, the map on, on the screen shows it. Cal, uh, Kansas Territory was situated right next to Missouri, which was a major slaveholding state. And unfortunately for the Missouri slaveholders, uh, most of the Missouri slaves were situated about 100 miles or less from that western border. Uh, that is, those who were in the western part of Missouri. And as a result, it didn't take much for many of those blacks uh, uh, to run away. But I would suggest to you that there is a lot going on in Kansas, some of which you have learned in, uh, in your other general history classes. As I said, Kansas was bleeding, quote unquote, by the late 1850s, and it was bleeding because literally a struggle was going on between those who were in favor of slavery and those who were opposed to it. Uh, Kansas had two governments in 1856, one at Lecompton, which was pro-slavery, one at Topeka, which was anti-slavery. And in the midst of all of this, in the midst of all of this, 
came abolitionists who not only were, were anti-slavery the, in the general sense, like most of the white Kansans, but abolitionists who wanted to, uh, to destroy slavery immediately and incorporate blacks as full-fledged citizens. And I want to be very careful here. White abolitionists in Kansas were nowhere near the majority of the white Kansans, but they were a people who were going to be heard, they, and they were a people who would have a decided impact upon those blacks who would eventually call Kansas their home. Uh, the abolitionists in the 1850s, the late 1850s, organized the Underground Railroad that ran into Kansas and, and ran essentially to the most, quote, liberty-loving city in Kansas at that time, Lawrence, Kansas. Lawrence, Kansas, as all of you know, is the home of the University of Kansas. Uh, in 1856, 1857, 1858, it was the slaveholders' hell because it was, it was a town uh, that was organized by abolitionists from New England, and those abolitionists would do everything they could to destroy the institution of slavery. And there were others uh, who lived in Kansas, uh, including John Brown for a while. John Brown's not from Kansas, but John Brown lived in and operated in Kansas in the 18, late 1850s. John Brown and James Montgomery and, uh, and James Lane and others would literally go into Missouri and rescue black people, black men and women, and bring them to freedom in Kansas. Now to the slaveholders, they were stealing. <laughs> okay, let's be very clear on this. To the slaveholders, they were stealing property. But to those black men and women who were rescued, they were a godsend. To those black women and men who were rescued by, by individuals like John, John Brown, they were, uh, they were a godsend. Indeed, one of the points that I think should be made very, very clearly here is that Kansas is the only place that I know of, that I know of, in the entire nation where white men literally risked their lives to go into a slave territory to free black women and children and men. Now we know of Harriet Tubman in the East, but, but I don't know of any instance where, where white males actually engaged in this kind of activity except in Kansas. But I would also suggest to you that far more slaves were going to act on their own. That is, uh, some slaves would be rescued by John Brown and others, but far more slaves would rescue themselves. That is, they would make their way to Lawrence, Kansas. They would make their way to the Kansas-Missouri border, which literally symbolized freedom. The western border of Missouri symbolized freedom. They would make that dash to the, to the Missouri border, and they would go into Kansas territory, and from there they would be free people. I love this. This is, this is a slide that's from a a mural that's in the Kansas State Capitol. So they have embraced John Brown, <laughs> okay? Or at least many of them have embraced John Brown. Yeah, he's larger than life there. Uh, but let me talk not about John Brown, because you all know that story. Let me talk about Henry Clay Bruce. Henry Clay Bruce was an African-American slave from Missouri. Uh, he eventually decides to strike out for, uh, for his freedom. And essentially what he does is steal himself. By the way, Henry Clay Bruce is the brother, for those of you who know African American history, he's the brother of Blanche K. Bruce, who becomes the second uh, black senator in US history after Hiram Rebels, who of course has a Seattle connection that we'll talk about a little bit later on uh, in these lectures. But uh, Henry Clay Bruce uh, essentially steals himself and his fiance from Missouri to Kansas in 1863. And this is part of the, uh, the statement. I won't read the whole thing to you, but you get a sense of what's going, going on here. On July 8th, 1862, the Leavenworth Daily Conservative, I love this title, the Leavenworth Daily Conservative described the thousands of Missouri slaves who had made their way into, into Kansas and found freedom in Kansas. Uh, the paper said, and I'm quoting here, these, these poor souls found their way into the Union lines, protected and, and brought by the Union soldiers into the freedom-loving state of Kansas. Others still crossed the Missouri River in search of liberty on a bridge of ice, which God, in his infinite wisdom, has built for their special accommodation. <laughs> I, you know, well, you know, I don't know, but, 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 but understand, understand what's going on. Obviously, the conservative is saying that there's, there's a phenomenon that's happening, that there are thousands and thousands of black folks who are finding liberty in Kansas. And indeed, they were welcomed, or many of them were welcomed, by Kansas abolitionists, white and black. Uh, indeed, there was the 
Kansas Emancipation League, one of the most active, one of the most radical of the abolitionist organizations uh, in the country at the time. Let me read to you the words of one of the members of that league, Richard Cordley. Now, there's no reason you would know Richard Cordley. He's certainly not uh, Wendell Phillips or William Lloyd Garrison, but he was as dedicated to the cause of the destruction of slavery as they were. Cordley talks about these blacks who were coming into Kansas in 1863, 18, 1862, 1863, 1864. And he says this, the Negroes are not coming. They are here and they will stay here. They are to be our neighbors, whatever we may think about it, whatever we may do about it. He and the Emancipation League and, uh, and others in other organizations like the Ladies Refugee Aid Society, which was a black women's organization. And this is a remarkable group because these were black women who themselves had been slaves only a few years earlier. These organizations provided all kinds of support and, and means of rescue for those who were coming into Kansas in 1863, 1862, 1863, 1864. As they entered, as these black folks entered Kansas, uh, they tried to help as best they could. They found jobs as best they could. Uh, mostly they found jobs harvesting the crops because Kansas, and Kansas was very proud of this, Kansas sent the largest proportion of its male population into the Union Army of any state in the nation. Kansas sent the largest proportion of its male population into the Union Army. So there are a lot of farms that are understaffed. And a lot of these black folks began to work on these wheat farms and various other farms uh, in order to help the Kansas economy. But I would argue that most black men, much like most white men in Kansas, went into the Army. Black men, especially those from Missouri, those from the Indian Territory, those fugitives from the Indian Territory, those from Arkansas, knew that the only way they could be truly free was to destroy uh, the institution, uh, the institution of slavery. Let me go ahead here. This is, a, this is a recruitment poster, but there really didn't need to be much recruitment because a lot of African-American males decided uh, to join the Union Army. And in fact, we all think in terms of Glory, the movie with Denzel Washington and Morgan Freeman, you know, the 54th Massachusetts Infantry Regiment, which officially was the first regiment to be recognized by the War Department, but unofficially the first blacks to be organized into a military unit at the state level. Exclude the Indian Guard in, in Indian Territory. At the state level were those units in Kansas, and there were three of these units uh, that were going to be organized in Kansas. These black men, former slaves, many of them, no, most of them former slaves, were now going to use the rifle uh, to fight for their own liberty. It did not take long, however, for these new black Kansans to recognize the relationship between soldiering and citizenship. In October 1863, 23 delegates representing 7,000 black Kansans gathered at Leavenworth for the first meeting of the Kansas State Colored Convention. Now again, remember, these were folks who hadn't been in Kansas three years earlier, but by 1863, they are gathering together to talk about their future uh, in their new state. They pledge, they pledge to their new home, their loyalty, their fidelity, uh, but they also express, not surprisingly, a desire for full citizenship even when the Civil War was still raging. In other words, even when slavery itself had not been destroyed. The convention called for a number of things. I'll go through a couple. They called for universal male suffrage, Yes, male suffrage rather than universal suffrage. And we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the contradictions of Kansas, which is a radical state, yet uh, it's males who like to pride themselves on being radical voted against both black male suffrage or uh, suffrage uh, of males of color and female suffrage in 1867. So that's, that's another issue that we'll, we'll hold. But, uh, but the Kansas blacks understood their situation. They understood their own disabilities. They call for more self-help. They call for self-reliance. As they said in their statement, it does not follow. It does not follow that because so much is being done for us that we cannot do anything for ourselves. It does not follow that because so much is being done for us that we cannot do anything for ourselves. Finally, the convention issued a challenge to white Kansas. And this, this kind of challenge would be the first of many that would extend how about up until the year 2000? And this challenge went something like this, and I would just read part of it. Our misery, our misery 
is not necessary to your happiness. Your rights can never be secured while ours are denied. Your rights, they're speaking to white Kansans, your rights can never be secured while ours are denied. Black people were becoming free. They were becoming free in a variety of ways. They were becoming free not simply because of the actions of white men in Washington. They were becoming free not simply because of the action of white men in Kansas, uh, people like John Brown, although I will argue that the actions of those men in Kansas and elsewhere uh, were a major force in terms of creating the idea that the West, the post-Civil War West, was going to be a place for, uh, for opportunity and liberty. But I would also suggest that black people were becoming free themselves essentially by their own actions, not simply by running away or walking away from slavery, but by using every single device at their disposal to challenge the institution. They were very much like the young Charles Mitchell, Charles Mitchell in 1860 challenged slavery by running away. And there were thousands of others who would do the same thing all over the West. And as a result of their actions, they made sure that slavery wouldn't sink very, very deep roots in the, in the West. But I wanna, I wanna, even as we end with this, I wanna caution you and I wanna sort of look forward to this and look forward by, by expressing you, to you the words of at least two former black Texas slaves who had concerns about but also believed in the promise of liberty once slavery was destroyed. These slaves were Felix Haywood, I've quoted him a lot tonight, uh, and of course, H.C. Smith. Let me read Haywood's quote. Haywood said in 1865, we know freedom, these are his words, we know freedom was on us, but we didn't know what to do with it. Freedom would make folks proud, but it didn't make them rich. Contrast this with the statement of H.C. Smith, another former Texas slave. Freedom in poverty and in tribulations, even amidst the most cruel prejudice, is still sweeter than the best bed or the best clothed slavery in the world. As this next lecture will show, at least I hope it will show, slavery in the West was dead, but freedom would remain struggling to be born. Thank you very much. I want to go to the, to the next slide. I want to leave this up, folks. As I said before, this, was, this is my dedication to Constance Thomas, a woman who helped me enormously in terms of uh, uh, pursuing the, my path, my chosen occupation of African American history in the West. We have a few minutes. I guess we have just a few minutes left uh, for questions. Um, I had a question about um, citizenship in terms of um, when people were in the territories, because until... Um, the, I believe it's the 14th Amendment, no uh, African Americans or did not, were not citizens of the United States. Were there any provisions in terms of, those ter in terms of territories that um, African Americans actually were citizens within those territories? Uh, well, I, I don't think, well, let me put it like this. Citizenship is always contested. And certainly there were those who argued uh, in different states or different places that African Americans weren't citizens, but there were others who argued differently. And the case was supposedly, the case of black citizenship was supposedly settled by Dred Scott. But as you all know, Dred Scott didn't settle anything. Dred Scott uh, you know, helped to bring about the Civil War. And it's the Civil War that would settle the citizenship question. But uh, that there were, there were African Americans who moved to California, at least, and who came from places where they had been citizens before, who believed that they were citizens in California, although they didn't vote. But they did protest to gain the right to vote, and eventually they would triumph. Uh, there were black folks, and most of the black folks who came to Texas were not citizens. Most of them who came were slaves. Uh, and they obviously did not contest with their citizenship. So, so the question of citizenship is to some extent determined by, by the source of the migration. But ultimately, and again, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself in terms of the lecture, ultimately black folks would gain citizenship and voting rights uh, in some instances far more rapidly in the West than elsewhere. Voting rights would come for all African Americans in 1870 with the passage of the 15th Amendment. But there is the Territorial Suffrage Act, and I know I'm giving away the story now, but the Territorial Suffrage Act came in 1867, and that established voting rights for blacks in places like 
Colorado Territory and Wyoming Territory and even Washington Territory uh, as early as 1867, although as you're going to see, black folks voted in Washington Territory even before 1867. So to say the least, this is complicated and complex. Uh, but certainly, as a general trend, voting rights, if voting rights are an indication of citizenship, voting rights were going to be established earlier in the West, even than in, even than in the Reconstruction South. One, one more question. You talked about the wealthy Indians who owned slaves. Mm -hmm. How many were there, how many wealthy Indians were there, and how did they get that way? <laughs> and what happened I, to them? <laughs> uh, well, again, it's a very complicated story. I think there were, certainly there were, as in, as in the general society, there were Indians who essentially adopted uh, civilization or European civilization, and they became involved in sedentary agriculture, and if they were lucky, they acquired land. If there were Indian women who married wealthy and prominent traders, then all of their descendants became wealthy. And as I said, that's one of the reasons as to why these people began to inherit slaves. Uh, but in many instances, once slavery, and this is the unfortunate thing, once slavery was established and once some people gained slaves, gained control over other people's labor, then they were able to accumulate wealth at a faster rate uh, than others who did not have slave labor. And as a result, these enormous class divisions began to emerge in Indian territory. So, so there, there are a variety of forces that were at work uh, before, even before the Trail of Tears, that would, uh, would sort of extend class barriers between and among Indians. Now, now, let me be very clear on this. This doesn't hold for, if you will, nomadic peoples like the Apache. It doesn't hold for the, for the Comanche. They, they had a slavery, but it wouldn't be the, uh, the kind of slavery that, that would support sedentary agriculture or that would look like plantation agriculture. The five nations uh, of the, the Old Southeast, the, the Chickasaw, the Cherokee, the Choctaw, uh, the Seminoles, those were the ones who were going to be most devoted to the institution of slavery because those were the ones, uh, those were the nations that most eagerly embraced Western civilization. And the tragic irony here is that embracing civilization for many of these folks meant embracing all that that represented, including slavery. And once they did, once they did, uh, and those who were successful, would, they would eventually acquire wealth disproportionately to the others. I mean, it's, it's hard to imagine now in, in the days long before there was affirmative action that the, that the Indians in the uh, Indian territory, that the Creeks and the Choctaw sent their sons, not their daughters, their sons to Harvard and Yale. <laughs> yeah, uh, but, but obviously that's not the image that we have. That's not the image that we have of Indian people. And I think that's probably a good note in which we can stop because as, as I said at the very beginning of this, the West, looking at the West and looking at the black experience in the West causes me, and I hope it's causing you, to challenge a lot of your conventional wisdom, a lot of what you call conventional wisdom about not only the West, but about the nature of race and the nature of American society. Okay, we'll stop at this point, and we'll see all of you one week from tonight. Thank you.